In this video, we will look at the development of patriarchy through the ages and how it is deep rooted in the advent of private property following the centuries old shift from primitive communism to feudalism. We will then uncover the effects that patriarchy has on society, after which the prevalent transphobia will be studied both through a pre-colonial and a post-colonial lens to better understand how today's heteronationalism and heteronormativity are the direct results of the British colonization of the subcontinent. The search for a genuinely matriarchal culture has long intrigued both anthropologists and archaeologists, but neither have found the evidence to support the existence of such societies in the past. What they have found, however, is that women, though did not ever have power that could be said to be greater than that of men, they have indeed once been equal in power to men in truly egalitarian societies of the ancient times, only the remnants of which remain today. This was around the time when lived the pastoral nomadic tribes and the hunter-gatherers whose lifestyle was based on hunting animals, foraging for food and traveling around for fresh pastures. Men served the purpose of hunting animals for food owed to their physical strength, while women foraged and took care of the children while they were away. The division of labor and gender roles were clearly defined around the transition from the middle to upper Paleolithic eras. The social structure back then was built around Marxist primitive communism, where resources hunted and gathered were shared with all members of a group in accordance with individual needs. This was essentially a true egalitarian society with the distribution of power believed to be equal between the two genders. But then man chose to settle down and own land of his own, after which came the Neolithic agricultural revolution. Thus began man's search for resources to defend himself against his foes and protect his land and family, and power shifted to the physically stronger males. Sons, uncles and grandfathers began living in close proximity to each other, while the property was passed down the male line and female autonomy was eroded. This practice elevated the idea of property and the need to own land and control a workforce, leading to the domestication of nature and animals and men owning private property. This private property, according to Frederick Engels, laid down the groundwork for what we don't know today as patriarchy. This I believe to be entirely true as during the Middle Ages prevailed the systems of manorialism and feudalism whereby peasants were dependent on the landlords that owned all the private property. And before this, during the nomadic tribes, the nomadic times, the division of labor was well defined as men used to hunt and women used to take care of the children and both were said to have almost the same level of power. But with the advent of private property, following the agricultural revolution, men rose in power and this transformed women's role from an equal partner to a subordinate wife. Landowners became protectors of what was theirs. Those that did not own land of their own often plundered and murdered those that did and upon conquering their land used to take their women as slaves and concubines, raping the women of the opposing clans, not because of this sexual frustration but just because they thought that they could. Women were seen as property which led to heterism, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, and pr prostitution and adultery valued primarily for their sexual purity and ability to have children and were exchanged between families for a price while a close watch was kept on them to ensure their chastity. Wealthy landlords chose to keep wives and concubines in the hundreds as the number of wives they had served as a symbol of wealth and they also enslaved them as agricultural workers and for bearing new slaves. The introduction of private property completely enslaved women who became responsible for producing heirs to the property and keeping the family line in continuity. Class exploitation and sexual repression emerged together to serve the interests of the proprietary class. It is this domination that sowed the seed of patriarchy and the concept of male honor came to be the norm. Patriarchy only ever grew thenceforth. Capitalism soon followed and with it brought new modified means of violence, which came disguised in the form of the patriarchal family and the state, 
leading to two classifications of patriarchal systems at the macro level and patriarchal relations at the micro level, feeding on a pre-existing system of oppression and compounding many of its defining characteristics. Patriarchal values are embedded in Pakistani society, which determines the subordinated position of women. Gender disparity in Pakistan is clearly evident by seeing the country's ranking according to the Global Gender Gap Index as 141st out of 142 countries with respect to economic opportunities and political participation of women. This gender inequality weakens women's position in society and makes her vulnerable to violence. Moreover, according to a 2011 poll of experts by the Thomson Reuters Foundation poll, Pakistan is ranked the third most dangerous country for women in the world. The underlying belief behind this gender-specific violence is the superiority of men over women. Now think of violence against women to be a spectrum, on one extreme end of which lie honor killings, rape, domestic violence, etc. that the mainstream media often highlights. But on the other end of this spectrum, you will find casual sexism, objectification of women and all the things women go through on a daily basis that nobody seems to talk about. But rather, it seems everyone, including women themselves, have accepted to be okay. Some of the many offenses committed against women, some of which have become traditionally accepted, and other various issues women face include honor killing, rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, acid attacks, being burned, kidnapping, domestic violence, dowry, murder, forced marriages, custodial abuse, son preference in society, I mean, and discrimination in food distribution, burden of household work on women and young girls, lack of educational opportunities, lack of freedom and mobility, sexual harassment at workplace, unequal wages, lack of inheritance or property rights, male control over women's bodies and sexuality, and no control over fertility or reproductive rights. Furthermore, in the patriarchal family setup, an obvious manifestation of inequitable gender roles is the power delegated to males and older family members who safeguard family honor by monitoring female family members and punishing shameful behavior that could tarnish the family reputation due to which women suffer yet again as patri patriarchal control over women is exercised here through institutionalized restrictive codes of behavior, gender segregation, and the ideology which associates family honor to female virtue. The institution of family gives men a powerful and a privileged role because the family system, especially in Pakistan, has sexually divided roles with severe con consequences. Traditional gender roles make man the breadwinner and head of the household, while the woman is reserved for domestic activities such as the bearing and rearing of children, supporting her husband emotionally and putting her interests behind those of her husband's. It is also widely believed that women are not capable for the tasks that are believed to be that are believed that men are better suited for, such as earning for the family. I think this statement to be completely false. It is not that women are not competent for such tasks, but that they are not given such opportunities to pursue the motivations and goals in the first place, unlike the men in the society. Most women in our country are brought up with conservative and traditional mindsets that do not let them pursue their passions, but confine their life's purpose to finding a suitable husband for themselves, due to which they cannot secure a stable financial standing for themselves and can and completely lean on their husbands for financial support. This is why the reason that this is the reason why most women, while having every reason to still avoid filing for a divorce in Pakistan. Now, people compare the United States divorce rate, which is 50%, which is also thrice that of Pakistan, without keeping in consideration all the factors that come into play. As previously stated, Pakistani women lean on their husbands for financial support. And if their marriage goes the wrong way and they feel they need to file for a divorce, they simply choose not to because where will they go? Where will the children go? This is why women often have no other choice than to stay in abusive marriages as they have primarily no other means of survival. 
moving on at the state level to men have oppressed women every chance they've gotten pakistani legislation inherited a set of freedom restrictive laws known as the hudood ordinance of 1979 that were enacted during the dictatorship of general ziaulak in this repressive era the zina adultery ordinance regarded adultery and rape as the same crime and gender segregation was implemented in all public social gatherings these excessive laws especially targeted women's mobility such as the doctrine of modesty shawl and four walls women's dress code also came under close scrutiny and became a measure of their modesty chastity and spiritual purity general hawks extreme instrumentalization of islam made it easier for clerics and self-proclaimed moral guardians to target women and subject their body to gendered shame politics the legacy of hawks gendered politics of shame continues to be visible in other institutional forms state te- television especially advertisements and print media continue to perpetuate stereotypical and state sponsored ideals of pakistani femininity that associate piety with traditional female roles of a nurturing mother a devoted wife and an obedient daughter moreover for a very long time women have almost had no control over their own bodies abortion had been criminalized since the british colonial times and this practice continued even after the partition as the pakistan penal code ppc largely draws from the colonial indian penal code of 1860 It was only in 1997 that finally an additional clause was as added to chapter 16 section 338 of the PPC and induced abortion was made permissible. Meanwhile, throughout our history have existed feminist ideals who have stood up against such oppression coming to the forefront only recently thanks to advancements in media and education. Fatima Jinnah for instance fearlessly led thousands of women to stand up for their well-being even before Pakistan was created soon after Begum Rana Liaquat Liaquat Ali Khan sorry Begum Rana Liaquat Ali Khan founded the All Pakistan Women's Association in 1949 aiming to further the moral social and economic standing of women across the country Similarly the Women's Action Forum was established in September 1981 lobbying and advocating on behalf of women without the resources to do it themselves However the real wave of feminist struggle arose in 1980 as a reaction to General Zia's controversial implementation of the Hudood Ordinance which asked rape victims to present four eyewitnesses for their claim to be accepted The feminist movement in Pakistan entered a crucial period after in 2008 with the advent of private media channels and social media gaining momentum as women were increasingly able to share their ideas and beliefs. Now talking about feminist theories there are two dominant threads of feminist discourse in Pakistan. The first is a modern Islamic feminism and a secular from feminism. Modern Islamic feminists seek to further women's rights by redefining Islamic views and focusing on the female-centric laws Islam offers. This form of feminism appeals largely to the lower, middle and upper middle strata of society which looks to religion for answers. Secular feminists consider feminism as an extension of basic human rights regardless of any religious connotations. Once again these women are labeled as protagonists of western culture by those who can misconstrue islamic teachings to suit feed their own principles other feminist theories are classified as radical feminist marxist feminist and socialist feminist in all of which patriarchy is a central concept however the radical feminists have faced significant backlash for being transphobic as they classify themselves as turfs and its full form is transgender and exclusionary radical feminist who reject the assertion that trans women are women while excluding trans women from women's spaces and opposing transgender rights legislation such transphobia that we see in our society has its roots in a pre-colonial british india non normatively or non binary gendered pakistanis have experienced their fair share of a long withstanding history of discrimination and shame that can be traced back to british colonial rule of india when the british started expanding through their east india company they had more than just colonization in their minds 
they set out to promote you know they set out for christianization as well and when they saw the diverse people here and the non binary genders they appealed uh, sorry they appeared harmful to their church of england protestant values and their family model like th- their values were there's this husband and there's the wife and they're going to have the children and the basically the family model according to their church of england protestant values but when they saw the diverse people there and so they basically opposed anything and everything that slightly threatened the culture they set out to promote they saw the natives and especially the non binary population as filthy and inferior and felt the need for gender preservation which led to the criminal tribes act of 1871 which was a colonial law that criminalized non binary genders because it posed a dangerous threat to colonial rule and order some middle class indian men supported this british decision and backed extremely harsh policing measures against the hijra community and such indian middle class attitudes left their imprint on post colonial governance for instance lala badi prashad of the indian reform league suggested that a certain island or hill should be selected where this unix may be inhabited and all intercourse with towns or cities intercepted Similarly the famous muslim intellectual sir sayed ahmed khan wrote to a high ranking colonial official in 1870 that hijras lent themselves to practices as abhorrent to our feelings as they are unmentionable recommending that hijras be confined to certain localities within which they must reside during the remainder of their natural lives not going beyond the limits thereof Soon after this in 1871 the British passed the Criminal Tribes Act which criminalized the transgender community in Pakistan sorry in India under the act eunuchs could be imprisoned for up to 2 years if they appeared in public dressed, dressed as a woman this act fueled the hatred towards the Khwarezer community in the subcontinent and it was further fueled following the eunuchs act of 1919 Such acts are the reason transgenders in Pakistan legally known as Khwarezira live marginalized lives as all the enmities towards them have been instilled due to hate crimes and british policies back in pre-colonial times the effects of which we can still see today they even though have the third gender option for national identity documents but legislation for comprehensive rights and non-discrimination is still lacking they are excluded from mainstream economic opportunities and state sponsored poverty alleviation efforts and have very minimal access to healthcare facilities due to stigma and discrimination workplace discrimination is a core issue in lgbtq discrimination and has been identified as a major contributor to the overall gender based violence on gender and sexual minority men and transgender women The economic and social exclusion of LGBTQ persons includes underemployment, unemployment, lower productivity. Hostile attitudes in the workplace can include being socially shunned by coworkers or passed over during hiring and promotions. These have negative psychological and physical consequences on a person's well-being. These factors establish a vicious cycle of unfriendly workplaces and a worsening economic situations for all. LGBTQ communities and sexual objectification of and deep seated patriarchal norms have restricted work opportunities for them i believe that gender itself is viewed through a very flawed lens by most of the people in our society according to michael fuko there is no inherent truth to gender it is constructed by social expectations and performed through bodies that are in turn regulated and controlled by the state Judith Butler Judith Butler also believes that gender is a social construct and holds the belief that certain gendered behaviors are natural illustrating the ways that one's learned performance of a gendered behavior what we commonly associate with femininity and masculinity is an act of sorts a performance one that is imposed upon us by normative heterosexuality however people choose to employ biosensualism short for biological essentialism which states that we are born with specific Im- immutable traits by virtue of our sex and that we are only defined by our genitalia forming the cornerstone of traditional patriarchal society structures of society and persisting today in the form of gender roles gender based exclusion and transphobia 
Myocentralism is very flawed in nature as it reduces individuals to their body parts and defines their identity to be what their genital states it to be, restricting the free expression of sexuality and gender. We are an identity of exclusion as only by virtue of exclusion we define the criteria for inclusion. Straight people imply heterosexuality in the same practice of exclusion by rejecting anything that is remotely unaligned with their heterosexuality and they define gender through the binary of the male and the female, though that is not always the case as many people are born with intersex conditions and born as hermaphrodites. The reason for rejecting non-heterosexuality rests in man's basic instincts for reproducing. Somewhere between the rise of imperialism came the legitimizing of monogamy and the family unit. Long before then, since the very beginning of time, man's basic instincts involve reproducing and ensuring the continuity of his bloodline. This came with man's irrational behavior of rejecting change and rejecting anything that slightly threatened their objective of procreating, including all non-binary sorts that did not agree with the traditional family unit that was being practiced from generations. Lastly, we need to take into consideration this certain degree of unrelatability that comes into play when trying to understand gender. We can never completely empathize with Syrian citizens who are being bombed and killed in the Midlands. Millions? What's wrong with me? Sure, seeing their pain and suffering invokes emotions of pain within ourselves too, but we can never completely relate. Poor, we do not exist where they exist, nor are we in the situations as they are. In the same way, a straight man will never be able to realize the struggles of being trans. He will try to understand their individual experience, which itself is connected to the broader framework of centuries-long acts of violence committed against them, but he will never be able to relate to it himself, for he was born heterosexual. So, when a man can never in his entire lifetime relate to the struggles of those that belong to a gender other than his own, how and why must he think then it would be okay to legitimize and impose his own beliefs and practices over them. Just like in religion, one cannot hope to make all others believe in that which he himself believes to be the truth. The Christians cannot hope for the Hindus, for example, to believe in what they believe. What they can hope for, in fact, is for both the parties to acknowledge the existence of both and this bitter but much needed realization that even though both exist as distinct groups, they do not really need to be divided. They can just accept their differences and coexist without and it is existing too. In the same way, all people should be more empathetic towards all the gendered, sorry, gender variations that exist by acknowledging their existence as well as shedding some light upon themselves and the patriarchal society we live in, which rejects anything and everything that slightly opposes their will and their traditional practices. What lies in one's pants should never be the question, but rather what lies in one's heart should be focused at. If only we knew empathy and compassion, and if only we were able to leave such enmities in the past, we would not only be able to reduce and finish completely hate crimes, but also progress as a nation. What an individual chooses to identify themselves as should no, never be another's concern. It should not matter to you or to me about the person in question alone. What matters is, though, that we all unanimously agree and take into account all the gender-based violence that has been done for centuries in other ignorance or complete and utter hatred for a specific minority group that has, been ha- that has hindered our growth and has divided us into different gender roles and categories.